necessary. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode. I thought about speaking about something that I... It came to me conceptually as the pattern of civilizations. But today, I'm, I'm just going to brush on top of that. Uh, what I mean by that is that I want to give... I'm going to give a talk about the pattern of civilizations later on. But uh, in this episode, I wanted to at least speak about its significance. First off, I'm going to start off by telling you, dear listener, that I write science fiction and in a chapter of a book I've written called The Messenger of Giants. It's not published yet. I want to take your attention to the year 5025, which the novel is set in. Uh, there are nine parallel dimensions of Earth, and there is a government called the Enlightened Society that is, for the first time, the first multi-dimensional government. It is governing various parallel dimensions of the same Earth. Now, in the year 5025, human beings have been divided, in, at least in, in my, how my novel is set, between the traditionalists and the futurists. And the traditionalists are those beings who's, who uh, believe they are a temporary beings. They acknowledge linear time. And the futurists are those beings which are like some of them are extraterrestrial, some of them are robots, some of them are whatever. Pretty much I wondered in the future if extraterrestrials were among us in civilization, some of them would not have the concept of time. Therefore, I considered, I called them the futurist beings that think they're eternal beings. So society is divided between creatures that feel they're temporary and creatures that feel they're eternal. Anyways, <laughs> there's a character in one of the chapters which I called Memphisto's Denial where in this chapter something unique is happening. The chapter starts off with a very successful architect. And this architect has been, is, is the, one of the most famous human being in many of Earth's parallel dimensions. His name is Memphisto and his family has passed away and he has become this incredible <clears throat> next level person in the book because he was the first architect on earth to be able to create a skyscraper that was between to a building a structure between two parallel realities and so that's why he's known as the most he's, he's automatically become famous in the world and Memphisto, what happens to him is that uh, he's signed up for this project where he thinks it's from the Enlightened Society, but later on reaffines there's certain things going on. Uh, he sets up for this project where um, he he's signed this contract where he has to, he's decided to go into this, there's this, I forget the name, Jesus Christ, but I remember the image. I pretty much created this alien planet where there were these red alien beings in there. They had purple hair and their eyes were, I think, glowing blue or something. It was very unique. And the reason Memphisto had chosen uh, the contract cause, um, and required Memphisto uh, to go into a machine and his consciousness to be reborn as a child of that species. This species has a telekinetic ability. This is all in the science novel, uh, science fiction novel I've been writing. And so pretty much Memphisto wants to go and check out the species, not to be only the first human being to make contact with them, the first human soul, but on, on another level also to learn from the unique skill that this, this alien species has, which they can make houses and buildings come alive. And so Memphisto is this next level architect and he's gone to study the different ways that he can learn to create buildings. The, and the greatest building he's thought of to conceive is a building that is alive on its own as if the building has a mind.
So the chapter dives into Mephisto being born to this alien species as like a little alien baby. And as he's born, he's he, there's a sort of soul group contract. And so he's born into this family where the grandfather is, is the one who knows the secret of tel uh, telepathic kind of communication. Uh, not telepathic communication, like uh, how to make a machine give life. And his family is known to be not only wealthy, at the same time his family is, uh, what do you call it? Uh, they they know the secret art of imbuing houses with life and also telekinetically moving things better than society, their society. Long chapter short. <laughs> What happens is Memphisto ends up growing up in this community and suddenly waking up. He suddenly wakes up and he realizes earlier than the contract, something doesn't go right in the transformation. And in some sense, he suddenly doesn't listen to the contract. And so when he doesn't listen to the contract, that's why the chapter is called Memphisto's Denial. He denies this contract of being an alien baby that he had before. <coughs> And his body's like on some ship in the atmosphere of, um, you know, somewhere on the planet, you know. So the reason I shared that. <laughs> is I, w I wanted to suggest. Uh, welcome all there is. Um, my keyboard's on the other computer, so. I'm I'll just say welcome, welcome to the chat. Pretty much this idea in the science fiction novel of Memphisto's denial is a suggestion of a sort of inner power pattern within the psychology, within the framework of the being, suggesting and implying a totally different reality. It's as if sometimes I have looked at my mind in the mirror to see that it, it can be anything. Anywhere my attention goes, it reflects back into many structures, many geometrical expressions. And so our minds are something that we are not well acquainted with. This is the fascinating thing. I find in the future, they're going to look at us and they're going to be like, oh my God, they did all this with using less than 12% of their brain power. <clears throat> And also, the reason I shared it was because a pattern of civilization can be seen in it. And what that means is civilization is endlessly evolving beyond the veil. And then, due to what was familiar to it, uh, how can I tell you? It's like, right now you're the known being and there's many things that are appear to you as unknown. There will come a time where you will be the unknown and there will be many known beings. You know? <clears throat> and what that means is... Uh, it's a kind of cycle of nature of civilization raising civilization. Something is happening more significant and profound than just uh, our ancestors uh, passing down the, tr the torch of their DNA, you know, the beacons of their DNA. It, it, it's also something where uh, the civilization, the effort of creature to be here, move, and then become, is, is, it's like that's a unique pattern. Now, there is someone by the name of Rupert Sheldrake who's spoken about morphic fields, and his, in another, in a more Gaian way of saying it, it's pretty much the memories of the planet repeating. So it's like right now, me and you are looking at this planet, and we're like, okay, it's just a rock in the middle of nowhere. You know, but at the same time, there are there are ways of looking at life where the moment is not just purely inanimate. It's not. It's like the inanimate didn't come first, then the animate. There are states of mind where the animate comes first. It's like there requires a movement of free will because before there could be any sense of uh, a change in design. Something cool that I remember, uh, 
somebody sent me something about was that uh, Alexander the Great was known to go and build certain fake armor, giant armor, to scare the people in battlefields. Now, of course, we weren't alive back then, but of course, this is a story. And just to take the consideration of the story's value, the significance of the story, it's one of those things where as if the mythologies left behind were always attempting to reveal more or to show a greater intensity. Just like how Alexander the Great did something and in some sense uh, had his army built like giant shoes or like a giant cracked helmet to kind of show as if like how big his army was. It's as if an action has a truth which is instantaneous to it, and it has a truth which is transferable. This was something that I had to kind of resolve before I could speak about anything. I can personally say that I am more acquainted to a sort of freedom transforming the nature of the conscious search, an experiential freedom. That means there is something experienced that makes the person recalibrate their attention. And I don't know how to say this, but it happens. And I think it happens when you notice life is more than your thoughts. And it becomes, a, there's a strange silence there. There's a strange solitude there. There are moments where you will be alone with this world. And you'll be like, okay, what now? And in those moments, there is a strange divine flame shining. It is, it is a sort of how fire, of course, there, before Dante's Inferno brought images to hell, fire was seen as a purification method. The cremation ceremony was a sort of purification, was a sort of transformation of the nature of something chaotic into something different. Now, of course, we are creatures that have to be sensitive to the elements. That's, that's like a cool game that every person's mind should play in trying to figure out how the elements of the world are being them and are moving with them. I want you to imagine that <clears throat> you look at fish underwater they they move through they call them schools of fish literally like a bunch of fish are going through the same waves the same current you see many birds flying and you see it's as if they are also they are also riding the waves of there it's as if all the birds are riding together do you know the wolves are running together the lions all have their pride. And so it becomes a state where the most common design, uh, um, those of the same kind, at least start off seeing the same thing. The human being with the addition of the mind has become a total different creature. That means if we saw five lions and we saw five human beings, and we wondered about their brain activity, the brain activity of the five human beings would be all over the place compared to the brain activity of the lions. Because it is about access and it's like evolution gave access to self-inquiry. At some point, the, the creature, this creature evolving on this species without language, without anything, suddenly snapped out, became conscious of itself. That moment where the objective evolution was like a cocoon became the, the, like the caterpillar that went into the cocoon became the butterfly, became the subjective evolution. <clears throat> Do you know what that means? That means we are standing in two types of moment. One moment... Clap for your objective existence. Clap, slow hand, clap for the atoms that are being you. 
But when it comes to the subjective, that is, that is, it's, it's like, it's all about piloting the state of mind. There are those who pilot with their eyes and there are those who pilot with their hearts. And the heart is simply the mind's kind of freedom. Certain things the person cannot rationalize. It's as if they weren't exposed to the patterns of even being able to filter. Do you know how many things in life happen that in some sense it's like this is the illusion. We feel that the same sense of unknown that the child feels and is strangely content with on, on, until the seriousness of life enters. <clears throat> I don't know how often this is said, but when you search for truth, you find the cause of your eyes. Do you know how intense of a moment that was? I remember I, I just read in a mist, I think it was the Bhagavad Gita or something. And I kind of realized it's about those who know. They're in constantly in the Bhagavad Gita, it says those who know me, those who know me. As if the, the truth of the whole existence is something that can be known. As if in many religions, the mind is pointed to as a discriminatory me mechanism, right? It's like, where is, what is the point of ethics? Let's hope people remember these values. That is law, you know? Law is remembrance. That's why it's important. <clears throat> That's why you shouldn't break laws, but you must evolve them. And what that means is it's the same honor. Pretty much I find it's not just people living on this planet. Many ideologies are living. And these ideologies sometimes become, uh, take the shape of business entities. Now, business is something where there are many motives directing the phenomena. It's, it's one of those things where the ship becomes larger as people jump in. Now there's some really large ships in this world. These large ships are directing the small ships because they are where the business is happening. They automatically, it's as if the flame uh, brings forth the moth. <clears throat> like just one night, you know, one summer night, just put a candle out and just see the dance of creatures, the dance of all the insects that will be drawn to that candlelight, you know. And humanity is drawn to a candlelight, but it is not... It is not a, a, it's not a visible thing. It's a, it's a call to action, which sin, if, if sincerely responded to, becomes an intuitive rhythm. Literally, life no longer becomes about like a robot calculating everything every second, you know? It's like, it's not just about the processing power of the machine. It's also about how it is used. You know, that it's like, it's kind of like art. Like I'm gonna, <clears throat> hopefully if I get the time, I wanted to create this YouTube channel. I, I draw these unique pictures, these unique drawings with pen. And uh, there's something, there's a technique I use, which is an emotional stance at the chaos and order of the moment. What that means is it's kind of strange. Life blesses the person that the eyes open with the world. I have been present in moments of victory. I have been present in moments of failure. I have been present in moments where I was in some sense held in a high light. I, I, was, I have been present in moments where I felt I was forgotten in the shadow. There have been many moments, many states of mind, but something I was aware of in all those moments, even subconsciously, was that there is something here that just keeps walking. And when a person realizes the will, like if your name is Will, look up your name. <laughs> it's like a person named William. You can say William is a divine name. The will I am. It's like the person is their will.
Attention is fascinating. When it becomes your teacher in regards to the harmony that have balance between heaven and earth, that means when the objective realm is no longer being resisted by the subjective realm. The objective realm will have chaos, by the way, guys. Just because you, you know, we, we, we you know, climbed a bit on, on the mountain of wisdom, it doesn't mean uh, uh, the chaos and order is like there's a resolution. This is a changing world. Think of it this way. If you want, you are given freedom as a being, think of it this way. Nature is given freedom too. That means back in the day, it would be a situation where the person would wonder for how long shall I remain afraid? Even though the person was walking in a jungle, like cities hadn't been built, towns hadn't been kind of <clears throat> formed. The person was walking in wilderness. And do you know what happens? The person freaks out, freaks out, freaks out, but after some point, learns to accept the voice of the environment. And the educational system has got it all wrong. It has got it so wrong. In a, in a strange way, it's a tragedy. It's like watching more, it, instead of people getting, jumping onto boats, from the Titanic, we're bringing more people onto it. That's that's the issue with the subconscious contribution to an inefficient system and trying to just do what's in your power. Sometimes life is one of those things where you wait, oh, how would I say it? <clears throat> you cannot avoid the battle scars of your experience. That means who I am speaking to you is, is think of it this way. It's a, it's a piece of clay and every experience I've had has shaped this clay. And so in 2019, after all the laps around the sun I've ran, it, it's like, this is where I am. This is what I am. This is what is present. But because I know of the law of change, do you know what that means? That means all laws change. All regulations, subjective restrictions, belief systems, they collapse. A wind will come and blow all of these. The Sufis would say there's something called dying before you die. And I was like, whoa. It's like dying before I die. It's like, hey man, get more, get more uh, paradoxical than that and there will be nowhere. Which is now here. <laughs> to be honest, what the implication of it is. Don't be afraid to know the core of your intelligence when every day happens only once in the way that it does. The past is to be honored, but not to, be, uh, not to become your blindfold. Sometimes it's like, you know, just like how a person takes a shower every morning. It's like one of those things where it, it's, it's a situation where the total refreshing of the system and if you tell me, is it more exciting to have a belief, I'll say, uh, compared to not having a belief, and I'll tell you not having a belief is more exciting. Because you're not limited by the language. It's not, it's like, it, like sometimes beliefs are emotional contracts between subjective symbology and actual reality, reality which appears to man as three-dimensional space uh, and fragmentations of image, at least to a subconscious. That means the way we're expressing reality, the, the, the hidden eyes of the mind are not per se experiencing it like that. So right now I'm, for example, speaking, I, I treat language as a technology. Language is like a friend sitting in the room. It's, it's, not, uh, um, it's not me. That realization was so profound that I kind of noticed the apocalypse that will hit the educational system. The moment where the greatest professor is asked the greatest question and remains to just point at the greatest world. 
That is where we are left. That is the ultimatum of knowledge, collective responsibility towards an attempt at the potential ultimate efficiency. You can say, if the DNA could be interviewed and asked, what are you doing with this continuation game? The DNA may say, none of your business. That means it's un we cannot penetrate the depth of truth. But the DNA could also say that just watch what I do and you will know. Sometimes when reality happens for me, whether chaotic or order, it doesn't matter how cool of a divine agency you consider. It doesn't matter what images you have. I mean, assume all the images in your mind, they're like, uh, like, they're like writings on the shore that waves can come and wash off any moment, smoothen out. Because I'm telling you, the breath is a waving system, and we. this is why people, the person experiences thoughts moving. The reason is we feel, we experience thoughts because there is a sort of on-off thing happening with our biological intelligence. It's not just with our blinking, it's just with the heartbeat. It's kind of like if you just closed your eyes and just inhaled and exhaled and just suddenly could somehow visualize the same movement of your breath as the same movement of ocean waves. Like something, like imagine you're in a trapped in a mechanical machine silver world. It'd be like closing your eyes and trying to visualize what the ocean would be. Trying to visualize, uh, and it's as if like through your breathing, imagine you suddenly remember. Sometimes when one confronts the unconscious, their consciousness changes. When it changes, either the intensity of the experience will cause fear and they will immediately jump into a bunk bunker. It's as if the person is trying to fly. He jumps up but feels he's going to collapse. So because he, jumped, he feels he's going to collapse, he quickly just allows himself to drop into a belief. Trust me, getting beliefs in, in today's society is like going to a wending machine, putting some coins. Imagine it's like the amount of religious followers that are paying for religious ideology. You see, I have nothing against religion. It's just that there is greater dimensions. And it's as if you cannot have one ideology penetrating all contexts because it... Uh, even if it does, it reduces the limit. So what it means is people have a sort of, imagine they're a battery. Imagine they're like a sort of candle with, with a flame, okay? This flame is consciousness. The candle is the temporary biological body. So now, <clears throat> while this cam candle is lit, there is sensory perception. As there is sensory perception, we realize a sensory landscape. Because we realize a sensory landscape, we realize we are in a place bigger than our most immediate, what is imme most immediately in our control. So you see, this is part of the, uh, the thing about the maturity in Japanese culture, and many of their stories kind of uh, do a home run on this. What I mean by this is hit a home run on this because it's one of those things where they kind of acknowledge the child is going to be given a, a world where it is given freedom. Something really important that children must experience is they must experience a moment where they can feel free. That moment is so crucial because confidence is what sticks in your long-term memory. Now, I don't want to use that old-fashioned model of long-term memory and short-term memory because I, at some point I'm saying you're not even thought. 
<clears throat> and people would be like, so Mr. Bethune, what are you doing? You're using language to tell us we're not language. And I'll be like, what else can I do? <laughs> I think it's honestly about kind of returning to nature, chilling out, and eventually finding a decent level of a vision of the world that you feel you can walk in. The world can be told in any way. Do you know? That's pretty much a story. It's, an, it's like that's why they say... You know, once upon a time, like I, that means one moment in time it was considered. Do you know once upon a time means like it's it, that means it could be any moment in time. It could be any sort of time. <laughs> so once upon a time on a rock in the middle of nowhere, eight billion creatures realized they were awake. And so they wondered what civilization to build. And they came to the conclusion that they must first reveal what tools are in their immediate vicinity. The human, imagine the human being, I'm just going to go with this kind of narrative live. <laughs> These creatures on this rock realize they have something that surpasses everything that is material to them. They have a thought generator. They have a world generator behind their eyes. When human beings realize they are the value givers to phenomena, as if phenomena is a hidden internal experience, but it appears as if it's external, then what would that mean? Where is the internal? And the internal is kind of unknown in that sense. So what that means is consciousness is not just in the unknown of man, like it's not just we can't know it, the th issue is it is the unknown. Because it's as if, it's like even if you have an Abrahamic context behind your eyes, if you're listening to what I'm saying, let me tell you, it's as if the creator is everything and everywhere and within all and watching. And if it said the creator is everything, what includes as part of everything is also nothing. So what that means is the witness remains. Worlds come and go. Pilots take turns navigating the plane of existence. In accordance to the speed of the mind, there comes projections of various realities, projections of realities where there is freedom and acceptance, existential allowance. Those realities become paradise-like. Eventually, the person will feel their mind is older than them. This is a strange feeling, but many people will probably feel this. These are people who feel they are, they, they are like, they entertain the notion of old souls. Now, that doesn't make sense because the concept of soul is not in space and it's not in time. <laughs> so an old soul is a playful way of saying uh, a being that has access to more memories, has access to, has more of a collective appreciation of, of, the, of the moment. Because it was a very chaotic moment realizing that atoms are masquerading as personhood. There's something more here. And we have to reestablish, it's as if like if we can't agree, at least we can, uh, our disagreements can be our, a source of our commonality. A majority of human beings don't like violence. That's a good sign because that means they have found something in the time. Like imagine all the energy and time that violence took. Imagine what else that could be used for. 
Now imagine we create a utopic society where people are like, man, this utopic society is boring. This paradise we built on earth, it's so boring. So what happens is that means we have to translate external intensity through technology. It's like no longer, guys, this is the phenomenal thing. It's not just man escaped nature and came and built a city, a mechanical, a technological box to live in. It's that he left nature to be able to see nature. Do you see it in a more complex way? So what I mean by that is man did not just adjust himself to the world as evolution suggests, but he is now adjusting the world to himself. It's as if just like how in, in ancient kind of, I think it's Chinese tradition where there is a sort of a black dragon and a white dragon spiraling together into going towards the sky, you know, at night, you know. Objective force and subjective force are intersecting. Either our ability is from our environment, and if it is, we are the environment. Either our ability is not from the environment, and regardless of if we're in the environment, we were never in the environment. Or the unknown shall introduce the new. And in the presence of the new, even any extraterrestrial kind of notion and archetype will also be wondering. They will be clueless when it comes to the new. There are many patterns. Sometimes I thought it's like from some part of space, there's like giant speakers and it's like waves hitting planets. It's as if I thought evolutionary behavior was a reaction of a wave hitting the planet. I felt like just like how a leaf moves in a river and the leaf dodges all the rocks in accordance to how the river moves it, I thought that the human character, just who the person is, is being moved by a river of light, pretty much how light is being sensory experience for us. You see, the thing is, we not only need to cultivate contentment and just study pretty much the objective realm, that doesn't just lead to a sort of strength, but to study the subjective realm also leads to a strength. And pretty much people have to realize there is no longer any classification or grouping. There will come a time in the future where we're going to realize that borders were in our minds, not actually out, out there. Even It's like even if there is a wall between countries, it's like, so what? The land is the same. So what that means is it's kind of, I call this an evolutionary return to nature, which will lead to, in some sense, It's like chaos and order, instead of fighting, co-create. If your attention is on life, you will remain in life. If your attention is not on life, think of it this way, your attention navigates you. Right now, something has navigated my attention to be here. Now, whether it's internally originating, externally originating, these are different factors. Sometimes it's like there's no... Uh, logic to the moment because it's not linguistic and there's just an emotional intelligence that's becoming will. So it's like, think of that person who became angry. There was something else moving that person. Now in ancient, like, you know, the superstitious people were like, whoa, this dude's possessed. But the guy was just angry. But he, they weren't wrong when they said he was possessed. He was not possessed by some strange entity in, in another dimension. The guy was possessed by his own past, by how he felt he should have responded in the past. Do you see? I say it, Max, if you have to pay 2% attention throughout the day to your past. 
Because the more your past is in front of your eyes, the less you're seeing what's in the present moment. And it's the same with the future, but the difference with the future is that authenticity can make the person um, embrace the future, but realizing that the engines must turn on from the present. Right now, our species, it's like we, we just have to think of various ways. <clears throat> um, we have to build a story to the world that is efficient. We can't find truth because the situation is too big. Scientists cannot index everything that is out there in the cosmos to be certain of an equation. So what does that mean? That means from the start, everything is a fabrication. Dear ladies and gentlemen, we are not the thoughts that we have. The thought comes and goes. It's, it's evident. Every day you wake up, it's like you're like, okay, new day. How is it a new day? Because the thoughts of the past aren't awake in the same way. Eventually, life becomes like we do. when you discover the presence of your attention, your attention goes to value and contribution. There's a quote by Ravindranath Tagore. This man was an Indian polymath. He says, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. What does that mean? That means the child ran after its desires first. It reached the fruition. It reached the ultimate luxurious state of the mind only to realize personal victory is hollow when the collective stands. There is something more here. You know, it's like there is so many dormant abilities which are actually intense responses awaiting. They say the octopus, uh, the octopus, um, it's a kind of creature where it changes color, not just to reflect what's underneath it. It changes color to communicate as if the speech, how an octopus communicate is through their color change, right? Now, if you take into this into consideration, what that means is the mind of the octopus is being the language of the octopus. The mind's natural expression is being the classifications of subjective phenomena. All these categories we have for the subjects of the world. I am not impressed with the failure of the educational system to communicate that we're not here all to just bask in uh, pools of green. We are here to kind of bring out the inner mind of the planet. We are here to externalize nature, crystallize it into more sophisticated ways. Right. Eventually, we're going to realize. All right. So, how many, how many hundreds, uh, uh, centuries are going to go by where we're just like, all right, I'm a biological being. I'm a biological being. Eventually, at some point, deeper questions will arise. It's unavoidable. This is why I find eight, um, uh, eight, the atheistic approach and the theistic approach both made the same mistake. This is why they're always beside one another fighting. The reason is they made the mistake of thinking a certain image, a certain uh, action 
was the correct action. You see, it's, it's too empty to have a reference point. But we create reference points to exist as individuals. So it doesn't mean we shouldn't get, we should get rid of these reference points. It just means we have to wonder what the cool the greatest thing is. We have to engage our objective intelligence, subjective intelligence, and emotional intelligence. And through the will of the kind of witness of the moment, the mo moment moves on. So it's a call to service of exploration of the unconscious, uh, of the collective unconscious. It needs to be explored. People, some people are eventually going to be like, okay, what is this mind that's going on here? You know? I feel every human being's mind harbors within it a secret pattern, a, a, a sort of unique design, a sort of treasure. This treasure must be actualized. Even in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, self-actualization was the top of the pyramid. And I consider that you shouldn't see this as something where some people may be critical of what I say, but this is how I kind of see Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that just when you reach the top of the pyramid, which is self-actualization, the whole pyramid is reversed. That means there is never a top of the pyramid. The top of the pyramid is connected to another bottom of another pyramid. And the top of that pyramid is connected to another bottom of another pyramid. So eventually it becomes the integration of the various dimensions of self through the recognition that they were all moving in the same moment from the beginning. This is, a, this is called a sort of reverse engineering into how the world was dualistic for you. Now, it means that um, um, to care for your experience, you have to get access to pure data. Think of it this way. Think of it this way that, let's say, let's, let's, I'm going to take it, I'm going to, start this from a perspective of let's say the foolish way let's get over the foolish way so we can talk about the foolish way pretty much the question comes down to the foolish what's the foolish way to approach the unknown and the foolish way is to be in a state where you're only limited to self-generated data so you got to make sure as you live throughout the day, this, this could be said to be what is mindfulness, that as you live throughout the day, you're, con you're conscious of the texture of the moment. That in, that in this way, it's as if no longer you fear and anxiety eradicate. It's as if they were never there. Kind of like how Napoleon said, impossible is a word in a fool's dictionary. <laughs> And of course, no man can teach, how, uh, teach a lion how to roar. The circumstances of the world will. You have to take into consideration that there are there is some teachings that are vocal, but there are some teachings that are only experiential. Literally, they live life and it appears to you. Just go forth with a sort of contribution. Uh, sorry, not concert, contribution. The word I want to say is concentration. With a sort of concentration in the moment. This concentration doesn't mean you're trying to be in a certain way. It just means, just like we're learning as a species, just like how we observe objects, we can observe subjects. 
when somebody comes and says something to you, even if it's about you, you're like, okay, what, an, what this man's trying to be an artist right now and creating a version of me. You know, <laughs> It's kind of like, um, if you notice, the, uh, it, the mastery reaches a point where it has no enemy. This is why it always wins. I find that that's a kind of thing um, a lot of martial artists, if not restricted by vows of renunciation, would probably say, if they weren't restricted by vows of renunciation. Because to be honest, the renunciation is like, what are you renouncing? What are all these monks around the world renouncing? What are they trying to attain from just putting everything aside? You know, to be honest, it's as if what they, what they don't realize is that they're not here to renounce certain images because I, I'm telling you, especially for a lot of, uh, of waves of how many religious children are, are born around the world, there is a sort of reaction to image and the restriction of entering beyond a certain domain of questioning. So what does that mean? That means in Eastern traditions, the truth appeared as an authority. But in, I find the, so what I mean by that is either Eastern enlightenment was authoritative, the um, uh, Western enlightenment was expressive. It was through free expression. Free expression was one of those strange, unique things that Western society, I find, really tapped into. And it wasn't just Western society. I'm just saying it's the mentality of in order to be able to free to, to be able, to, oh my God, in order to be able to speak freely, the mind has to have an ability to freely access various ideas. That means it's like some a religious person doesn't want to see certain geometrical shapes. I have said it before, um, hum the human being, of course, is a social creature, yet what society appears, it appears as costume games. I'm telling you, there's, I've had many moments where I've just sat in a park and I've watched nature, and I've also watched people. People are a part of nature, you know, or at least how the nature of the external world appears to the individual. And you know what I see? I see many people trying to show themselves, trying to idolize themselves. There we go. That's what I mean by costume games. This sort of personal idol worship through uh, expression of what is culturally hot, you know, or popular. It's a, it's a, the status quo is sacrificing all the, uh, I, um, all the different ways the species could behave. It's kind of like, to be honest, um, we, we had, the person has to understand, uh, the personality is like a pen in the hand of a writer. What that means is, do you see the incredible freedom of movement of subjective phenomena? of attention subjectively. So what does that mean? That means after some point of kind of get, uh, being able to treat subjects like how you observe objects, kind of like how Aristotle said, it's a sign of an educated mind to entertain an idea without, it, without accepting it. What does that mean? Keep your distance from ideology. Entertain it, look at it, see what it is. When you go in the art gallery, look at every art, photo, uh, art on the wall, you know? But it doesn't mean stare at one artwork and don't do anything. Do you know what I mean? It, it means the appreciation is eventually uh, internal. You know, it's like the value of art is, believe it or not, it's not external. That's just paint on a piece of paper. It's, it, it's, it's that the artwork sets emotions. These emotions means a unique, in that at least that moment the eyes of the person falls on the artwork, there is a unique wave of a geometrical expression in regards to what memories are activated, what images arise. The mind, some people have said, um, Sadhguru uh, has said this very well, he says the content of your mind is not your choice. What does that mean? The content of your mind is not your choice. That means if somebody runs to you and says, Apple, you'll suddenly, the mind will think of an apple. <laughs> it's like there comes an image of an apple. 
Do you know what I mean? Or somebody shouts fire. It's like somebody man, tries to it will conceptualize like an instant image of a fire comes. So what does that mean? That means the mind, you can't control the content. Well, another way of saying this is certain amounts of your thinking is being processed by data from your external environment that was uh, out of the bounds of your free will at the time. You see, many things are out of, out, of, out of the person's control. So the thought of trying to control something in such a vast system can lead to ignorance. I remember um, something I learned in chess. Was this idea of kind of like it was strange. I kind of like somebody, I think I saw it in a YouTube video or something. The guy was saying that you certain chess masters practice playing chess with themselves. And what, what did that mean? That mean the guy would get the chess board and he would make the greatest move he can as the white pieces. He would turn it around and after it closed his eyes and after eight seconds open their, his eyes and try to make the greatest move as the black pieces after turning the board. And it was this constant view of the challenge of self. That means in, in, the, in moments where there are archetypes of order, be that greatest order. In moments where there are archetypes of chaos, be the greatest chaos. Because the human being, as much as I say you're not a creature of language, a lot of inspiration comes from one holding on to those ideals and eventually seeing the cultivation of attention to a certain reality. Anything you care for, you automatically attain a sort of observance of you see and so once you attain that observance your mind opens because you it's kind of like it's a data processing mechanism yet it's a data processing mechanism that while it's in, it's within a biological program has certain control that's why I say it, we are it's the era of the pilots of consciousness we're moving into this this is the next phase of humanity literally we are, we are piloting our attention we are not just being bodies that are moving around scared, savage, bewildered animals no more. It's like we're, we're, we're past. It's like, and to be honest, the reason is, is because the mind uh, in certain aspects is behind the body. What does that mean? That means we lived in a savageness, okay, as, as kind of our ancestors were primitive and savage. You know, pretty much it's like, um, based on how many people a person meets, it's like probably your ancestors, uh, uh, the, uh, there's no way to know the exact that. But what I'm saying is there is an interconnectivity with human presence all over the planet. Our conscious minds appear through different bodies, but our unconscious is the same. This is what Carl Jung, Carl Jung did something genius. He did something so genius that I, I don't know how many people acknowledge. He made distinct that the collective unconscious, there is a personal unconscious and there is a co collective unconscious. And if you think about that, that means what you don't know and what nobody uh, others don't know is what you have in common it means the unconscious is is just the vast black abyss frederick nietzsche he was kind of like definitely a profound messenger of his inner reality he said he has this quote where he says um 
one has to make sure in, in the process of defeating a monster not becoming one and he says something like he who stares into the abyss eventually the abyss stares back into you i mean i think i butchered the quote but you know what i mean like <laughs> so it's a <laughs> It's like those who stare into the abyss. Oh, stare long enough into the abyss and it will stare back into you. Something like that. So that's very important too. Because how much can the ma mind of man run in free anarchy? The thing is, there needs to... We, we don't even know. Like main, The mainstream doesn't acknowledge the subjective realm and the objective realm. They don't consider a subjective evolution. They just consider subjectivity as part of... As just a, a projection of the objective, a mysterious projection of the objective evolution. And consciousness cannot be proven, just like the Upanishad said, the seer of thought is unseen. That means the one who is aware that you are, you are aware right now, the awareness to how you are aware is on, it's literally, it's like good luck shaping that. <laughs> At most, it, it might lead to kind of like poetry or something, but uh, there's certain, the language threshold exists. I remember, uh, you know, kind of the mind of a person can be it can be very playful just like how you see the child's mind would animate that teddy bear or something into its best friend or whatever similarly the mind can animate also the body and what that means is sometimes when i've gone through a certain physical pain i've i've, I've literally animated my body and had a conversation and even though that's a strange concept, guys, but I'm just saying it's like the mind has an ability to imbue life. And by imbuing life, eventually reshapes its own subconscious based on where its attention is. Think of it this way, that um, imagine right now all the teachers in the world, the greatest teachers in the world, everybody, every, all of them. Imagine all of them. Uh, found you and they gave you their greatest teachings imagine all the greatest external teachers of the world gave you their greatest external teaching and you understood and absorbed all of it now you are standing what is the next teacher it's like you look for an external teacher all the teachers are like we've given you man what else do you want you know you know everything now so again the question comes what happens when you reach a sort of all-knowing external observance. <laughs> oh man, I hopefully I can hold on to the thoughts right here. How long can man dance in the conceivable? Eventually, a sort of multidimensional escape route would be sought. People have to realize sometimes they're not responding to what is happening in 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 like as the as the new new age community would say in the here and now. You have to sometimes realize that emotions are the differences between selves in various uh, memories. So, so when I kind of access a memory, I suddenly attain the viewpoint of an emotional preference through that moment. That means it's like my emotion in the moment is coexisting simultaneously in who I was in that memory. So it's like a little wave of the memory alongside of how you feel right now they intersect and instantly you kind of see the simultaneity of the mind 
the mind has a potential to allow attention to be simultaneous. What that means is your past and future can become the same moment and it's hilarious. <laughs> Sorry guys, I need a couple minute intermission, I'll be back.
Okay, guys. Uh, sorry about that. I'm back. I had this um, thought during the intermission. I thought it would be good to share. I'm probably going to do uh, give a talk on it later. I call it the subjective mutations of objective reality. These subject subjective mu mutations for now are in a sort of global society of judgment. We have to judge the phenomena around us to inspire it. You know, some people are afraid of assert uh, assertion to assert themselves simply because they're afraid of being judged, not realizing in a temporary kind of life. It's like, well, how, how, how have you let fear speak first? So what one does with these subjective mutations is to begin studying their shape and their design. At some point, the philosopher reverts back to a designer. And then the designer stands in that vast landscape. You can say free will is cherry picking out of the divine will. You know, it's kind of like the puppet wondering what's uh, what the strings are connected to only to realize it was never the puppet, you know, same thing with the virtual reality kind of simulation theory as well. So what's happening is like, it, it's not that uh, we need a name for it or not. The unknown is here to such a degree that divinity will be considered. Pretty much life is what to do or how the energy moves in regards to the designs accessible. It's kind of, I find uh, there have been certain true scholars in history. I feel they've attained the state of mind where the design of the idea is being valued in its own room. And the implication and integration of the idea with everything else is being valued in a totally different view. I find something very unique happened after man, after there was idol worship. Let's kind of bring the story of Abraham here and say that Abraham broke idols. Oh, these idols that people worship, they came back and they saw one hammer beside one of the idols and they were like, Abraham, did you do this? And he's like, no, this one God uh, crushed all the other ones. And they're like, this can't, this sticks and stones can't do this, you know, can't break the other gods. And then Abraham was like, why are you worshiping this? So I'm saying at some point, man thought an object was truth. And that was kind of slapped out of his hand. And what was the next thing? It was language. Suddenly, the re revelation became uh, the voice of God. Do you know? It's, it's very profound. Man went on from worshipping objective reality to worshipping subjective reality. And believe it or not, in 2019, this is why I say progress has been slow. Because we are still worshipping ideas. And what, what that means, worshiping idea, it doesn't mean you're like bowing at an altar, altar called ideology. It, <laughs> it means you're, you're subconsciously, when an idea comes into your space, you react to it animalistically. The observer within must be cultivated. And it's only cultivated through sincere moments where you can trust the data. The sages would say there's two things you can do in this life. You either trust it or don't trust it. Similarly, I have to trust the battery life of my MacBook at 30% won't suddenly just shut down. <laughs> just hold on, guys. Let me actually plug this. All right, guys, I think I just gave my laptop eternal life, you know. <laughs> There's, um, somehow my, 
I constantly feel the our survival doesn't just depend on how well we understand what we already know, but it also depends on a lot of things that are unknown yet. And the unknown is something that once you respect it, you can then truly see it. What I mean by that is that the citizen's mind is going to be declared having access to the unknown because many patterns can be engaged. That means we suddenly realize, oh my God, we can never see through the eyes of other people. And when we realize this, there comes a need to contribute and again share the inner dimensions with the outer. So just think about it. It's like, what is change? If you're an emotional person, truth will be in behavior for you. That means a stoic approach is, is useful there. If you're a person who's not emotional, what that means is you're probably, your ego is trying to be a conqueror. <laughs> you're trying to have the intellect of a, with the, the same intensity as a conqueror would, you know? And uh, to that approach, it's not going to be, it's going to be the emotional, believe it or not. Some people, you just have to wake them up, not by language, but by emotional consideration of the value of, of the life and all that. And believe it or not, life changes you to such a degree that your past will be seen from various angles that weren't seen from before. This is why I also have this relationship with thought that I don't take it seriously because it's kind of like every memory remembered gets reshaped in accordance to the influence of how the present moment is in that moment. So I could, all these, every time I share a story, <clears throat> I share a story, the next time I come to share it, it's as if there are sort of, patterns that have ways I've in this jungle I've already kind of like uh, gone through with my machete you know like so, so what I'm saying is that the, the, the it's the it's a sort of effort eventually you will play in the realms of objectivity you will play in the realms of subjectivity your emotions will play too between the objective and subjective and eventually there will come a still point there is always a still point in any system. Any system of intelligence has a moment where it has to close its eyes for a second. And so what I mean by that is that uh, are, we are oscillating between weakness and strength, the human mind. That means what's happening to children all around the world. Based on the experience they have of the world, they feel they're strong, they feel they're weak. If they feel they're weak, they claim to... Uh, the mind more than the body, so they feel their the person becomes introverted as a per, like appears introverted. I don't really entertain the introversion extroversion idea because I feel they are just reactions to the environment. So in accordance to what environment you're in, you have a totally different sense of comfort or discomfort. So what I'm saying is based on where the attention has gone. Uh, designs have been accessed. These designs, through their coagulation, recycling, whatever you want to call it, eventually become the new approach of the person. So what is hilarious is that in one sense, can we say, is there anything ever new? Does the new exist or is it just particles in a box being shaken? Do you know? And every time they're shaken, it's like we think there's something new. So, do you know, it, it, it's like, of course, the philosopher's gladiator arena should be kept open, you know. Philosophers must debate like gladiators, but then at the end realize it's a performance on a stage. I want to see human minds kind of like in it, like I see it because it's like an example of this is like these um, street kind of freestyle battles. And if you really go back, you see the ancient Greeks uh, had, in some sense, uh, they had the true vision of rhetoric. They understood language. 
the ancient Greeks had such a sophisticated, at least certain ancient Greek philosophers, they, their mentalities were, um, it was beyond majestic, you know? It's like when people ask, hey, king, what do you believe? The king was like, I don't know. <laughs> and then that I don't know became the unknown, the superior, the king of the cosmos. Use what is accessible, honor design. Progress depends where the attention goes. And Mr. Within is just saying, whoever you are in the world, care for the mind or the minds that are present in this universal sector. That's it. That's the least you can do. Realize every person is a comrade on a battlefield, on a ba battlefield between finding balance between heaven and earth between living a life of harmony, which me, uh, comes after the confrontation of disharmony. Once you have seen the darkness and you have seen the sun rise, and then you have seen the darkness and the sun rise, you definitely know what's going on. We are Creatures of a certain design, which means of a certain limited access to phenomenology. Phenomenology is the study of what the hell's happening here. <laughs> and so the true study of phenomenology will come down to how thought is being experienced. And eventually the, the thought will become like a light beam coming out of your eyes where, uh, sorry, not thought, um, Attention is like a light beam, it's like a spotlight, and the thought is the actor on the stage. The thought comes and goes, reanimates, the elements can be endlessly remanifest re in various ways. What does that mean? That means I can pick an object with my hand, but I can also just, like, imagine, I, imagine you get a glass of water, you get a drink, and then you drink it. And imagine now the same, you saw what happened was the cup moved with your hand to the same location where you drank it. Now you can imagine the cup moving without your hand. It won't happen, but I'm just saying the visualization suddenly has been made potential. So the mind saw something real and wondered about it in an unreal way, and that projection is accessible. Eventually these projections will be seen as part of a a consciousness stream or a river of thought. A river of thought would be like your attention is like a flashlight at night being uh, pointed to a moving river, you know, but in that river, it's various, uh, I call it geometrical patterns of uh, every la every word in, the in, in any language can have a geometrical shape. And geometry is a language. I personally consider it, it's like geometry is the next great language of all languages. There was something that um, those of the school of Athens that uh, that um, saw uh, geometry in a sacred light, they saw it, it was divine. Like the school of Athens was known to have guards who these guards would kind of like anybody who opened this room and saw these perfect solids, like, like a pure sphere or like a pyramid or a square it's as if the guards were told to kill that person because the shape that kind of a pure uh, uh, straight shape was on uh, is totally uncommon in nature so the philosophers thought oh my god this is like an alien stone that's gonna blow people's minds even though it was just a cube right so it was like a perfect cube so it was it was this notion of uh, pure geometry overwhelming the natural being <laughs> but the ancient Greeks, like in the school of Athens, the dude was like, yo, where's the bathroom? He opens the door, it's like the sacred cube, and he sees the sacred cube, and the guards are like, yo, man, you gotta die now, do you know what you've done? And the guy's like, I'm just looking for the bathroom. <laughs> and unfortunately, the guards will get him. 
because that's the story like that's history it's like they were brutal it's like the forbidden was held in in such high authority that to to penetrate it would mean defeat I'm going to, there's this thing in these talks that I do where I call it, it's a quote tunnel. <clears throat> and pretty much um, I lock my attention down on a notable person or a notable theme and I kind of open up a web page with quotes on it and I just read the whole web page and that's the quote tunnel. These quotes are from an ancient poet named Farid al-Din Attar. He's a kind of poet from, I think, I don't know, what is it, like 900 years ago in, uh, from Persia. So, so anyways, Farid al-Din Attar from Neshapur. He says, let love lead your soul. Make it a place to retire to, a kind of monastery cave, a, re a retreat for the deepest core of your being. He was also like a next level poet back in the day. And uh, I believe, uh, I think that was Omar Khayyam who was the mathematician, but Farid al-Din Attar was a very uh, remarkable mind. Anyways, he says, the sea will be the sea, whatever the drops philosophy. If the eye of the heart is open, in each atom, there will be 100 secrets. I hope if you're a scientist, you definitely heard that one. <laughs> uh, Attar says, the home we seek is in eternity. The truth we seek is like a shoreless sea of which your paradise is but a drop. This ocean can be yours. Why should you stop, beguiled by dreams of evanescent dew? The secrets of the sun are yours, but you content yourself with motes trapped in its beams. Turn to what truly lives, reject what seems. Which matters more, the body or the soul? Be whole, desire and journey to the whole, W-H-O-L-E, to the whole. <laughs> what he's saying is seek the completion of your nature. Attar says this was no friendship to forsake your friend, to promise your support and at the end abandon him. This was sheer treachery. Friend follows friend to hell and blasphemy. When sorrow comes, one's true friends are found. In times of joy, 10,000 10, gather round. When first you enter wisdom's sea, beware, a wave of indecision floods you there. Wow, that is so true. The unknown. That's like the first glimpse of the unknown. Attar says, the fruit of love's great tree is poverty. Whoever knows this knows humility. And uh, let me see if I could comprehend this fully. The fruit of love's great tree is poverty. Yeah, because love has its attention on poverty. Because it's, it's thinking of progress over individual mountain climbing, over selfish mountain climbing. And then Attar says, whoever knows this knows humility. I think I, I think I get it. What he's saying 
is that when you realize there is more than you here, your mind calms down. It's as if it's like a moment where if Mr. Within was like a commander, like, you know, the idea, the idea would be very playfully if we were back in like ancient Greek battlefield, it would be like sheathe your minds. And as you sheathe them, observe the environment. There's a total difference with, it's, it's something else, else, I guess I kind of bring a chess metaphor in here, where you let the mo person make the first mistake, as if your whole re experience the reality is defensive until you see the first mistake. And then in regards to, like that's another way of saying you let life move first and then you, you adjust to it. There's various ways the mind can move. In some sense, you are, you're a commander. Your attention is a commander of your ideology. It's like, think of it this way. A person that wants to wonders, wonders, just wonders. It's as if egos can relax, pride and glory can relax. We're just wondering here, you know. That if the concept of a true mastery of the moment was wondered about, How would one master reality if the unknown is moving knowledge? There is two types of power when it comes to, I find it, this is something that um, the mystical ear can hear. There is a natural power and there is an unnatural one. The unnatural one is the mind claiming it is superior to the external realm. The mind is painting the picture first. That's unnatural power. That's free will in, in the will of nature. But natural power is rhythmic abidance. I find many creative people who have the who eventually kind of discover, like many artists. I've 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 been privileged to meet many artists. Like, um, they all have found something that is like a hidden vision that they have followed behind their eyes, and the ability has come from that from caring to continue the path. You know, so, uh, <laughs> certain new age ideology kind of suggests the world like the person's looking for his life path. It's like an architect uh, who everybody's waiting for him to build, the, to create the blueprint of the building is wondering it like, should I build a building? <laughs> Life is pretty much either you're holding some holding energy or expressing it. When you express it, you evolve. When you hold it in, life becomes more like a static picture. This is why I say it's healthy, just like how people go to the gym. You know, so there's some people who go to the gym on a daily basis, each each day on the gym working on a different kind of body part of, of their health. So similarly, it's like every day you require to move a certain way your mind. You know, it's a diet of uh, psychological um, awareness. 
And what that means is, is learning to become acquainted with the subjective realm. And eventually you can become very playful with it. What that means is there is you can have an instant synchronization of a subjective phenomena with your objective phenomena. So what does that mean? That means it's, it's like sometimes when I hear a track or something like hear a nice song and I'm really in the zone, I kind of move my fingers as if like I'm a composer in my own universe. But as I move my finger, my mind can so playfully, subjectively see geom ge like geometrical lines extending from every wave of my hand, right? And it's it's like of course it's a playful inner kind of process I'm trying to vocalize. But I'm I'm telling you it's like in that moment there is there was a complete freedom of subjective uh, expression and objective uh, ex expression to uh, to harmoniously and synchronistically uh, to be synchronized moving simultaneously in another way right we say we are data processing creatures we are pattern recognizing creatures um, and we, we have reached a certain point where we don't only recognize patterns but we can create them so what that means is I think no point in history there has ever been such a sophisticated uh, uh, creature with uh, with such a sophisticated view on self so it's like sure if we want to think about um, the mistakes of now we would be crying for days it's like tissue tissue companies would uh, if we really wanted to look at like what's going on on this planet it's like tissue uh, companies would make a killing you know but I'm telling you <laughs> but I'm telling you there's there's something that I find the individual has a certain amount of responsibility for a certain amount of care for a collective I ideal that really doesn't have a shape, but it has to do with the effort of what each individual mind can contribute. So if we were to kind of design, um, like this, is, this would be a kind of approach where Mr. Within would say, just like throughout the day, learn from how the world happens. And when I say learn, doesn't I don't mean idolize it, I don't mean kind of like worship it but try when you really wonder about what's going on at some it's like the good thing about honesty is think of it this way when the person is honest with themselves then that if if they will realize what state of mind they're in and if that state of mind is more accessible the karmic weather is more harmonious due to that state of mind then the person will realize the external projection will be all, also harmonious it's kind of like how there was this Tibetan sage who said, unless you conquer anger, your enemies will be inexhaustible. And there is, there is a certain thing, I think it's like this should be definitely considered, that internal phenomena is occurring and being experienced, you can say it's like, they say an idea is a dime a dozen, something like that. But I'm telling you, it's like what that means is various ideas are traveling through and the person has to choose. So there's many moments in, especially in the scholarly mindset, you will find many treasures which you will have to leave behind. It's as if the, the heart of the person can care endlessly for a manifest universe. You can say even a person with a savior complex wants to save an infinite manifest process, right? So it's like you can't save existence because it's like what would you do after saving existence with the non-existence? What would you do with the space? Can anybody save space from anything it's like it's 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 like there's at some point the measurement ability reduces and we have we are left in raw experience those moments of raw experience are valuable but it's what what's occurring is like the people's minds are so advanced but the society is at their self-worth is not that advanced in the social structure i find eventually it's like what we would realize is that we can't, can't stop the world from changing no man can ch turn the earth the other way in their mind they can but in reality they can't 
you know just because one man wants the earth to turn the other way doesn't mean the earth will turn the other way but it means the opportunity and the what ifs of the current generation and the his moment in history the being is alive in to be considered think of it this way imagine like you you wake up tomorrow and just wonder for a second what if this was your first day on earth how would life be revalued? How would behavior and expression be reheld? That would lead to a, a great inspiration towards progress because oneself and other are codependent. It's as if woe, our enemies were our own projections, you know, through thought. Sometimes I say I have no enemies because I, in some sense, I have no idea if a person is an enemy or not. I don't have their eyes. Sometimes it's like certain things happen and I think it's because of a, a sort of karmic weather. You know, it's as if it's like, oh my God, the energy levels and just the ideology and the mindset of the day is just taking me here. <laughs> and, and then there are moments where it's like that ideology moves away there I, I call it it's like we are looking at the sky to such a point where after some point there's no clouds in the sky and you have a clear view the clear view of self realizing it is integrated uh, codependent with the world so you is you so this is the whole thing of the bodhisattva and buddha uh, archetype the archetype of the Buddha was the man who was taking, enlightening the self, the guy who just wanted to get up the mountain and go to heaven, you know, find that inner peace. The person wanted to just run into the pure land, someone who's climbing the mountain up. The Bodhisattva was the being who was climbing the mountain down. So imagine a being is climbing the mountain down and a being is climbing the mountain up and the being climbing the mountain up is like, what are you doing here? <laughs> And the being climbing down is that I have realized that once you get to the top of the mountain, you see, after you have reached the full enlightenment of a self, you enter the full simulation, the illusion of a caterpillar. So what I mean by that is that the mind is always standing in a more advanced way than the body. And if this advancement is acknowledged as a field of intelligence of, of a sort of conscious energetic presence, then at that point, stories no longer dictate reality. Nature can be itself again. That is the ultimate contentment. The, the child of the planet bowing at the opportunity to be. The appreciation, the importance of, do you know why we don't have a huge sense of justice nowadays? It's only in our entertainment. Society is, has, it's like, you know what's worse than society becoming a dystopia? Society becoming a boring place. I'm telling you, it's, it's like there's so much, so many ways. It's as if, like, if there was a, a, an idea that could make its ears into the leaders of all nations. That idea should be, make the society as beautiful as possible. Because the world is being a voice in people's minds based on the experience they have. You know, I, I think the best place to start off is this is this is a good way of kind of um, think of it this way. Um, the more people talk about the world, the more they will realize about themselves. The more they talk about themselves, the more they will realize about the world. The mind is dynamic. We only have a static belief-oriented way of acknowledging it. It's not enough. It's kind of like you can't write an essay on how ex uh, skydiving felt. The experience is, is more, is, it uh, holds a flame of truth that uh, uh, no simulated light can near it, can, you know?
a man who's we're gonna we're going back into the quote tunnel guys <laughs> a man whose eyes love opens risks his soul his dancing breaks beyond the mind's control I'm pretty sure Attar is rapping here. Attar could potentially be the first rapper in the world. <laughs> I'm joking. Let's continue. Attar says, A thousand for his love expired each day, and those who saw his face in blank dismay would rave and grieve and mourn their lives away. To die for love of that bewitching sight was worth a hundred lives without his life. None could survive his absence patiently. None could endure this king's proximity. How strange it was that man could neither brook the presence nor the absence of his look. The unfathomability, let's say. <laughs> Of the known and the unknown, the revocation of the living mystery. We re that is a source of great inspiration. The honest wonder. Oof, the honest wonder. Those two words together, they are uh, the greatest gift that the future generations can receive. Attar says, Where, uh, Were you indeed not blinded by the curse of self exile? that still grows worse and worse. Yourselves would know that, though you see him not, he is with you this moment on this spot. <clears throat> I don't know, I think it's uh, Dr. Zeus who's translating this. <laughs> Let's go to, um, I'll go into Who should I choose? I'm gonna to go to quotes of Hafez. Let's let's kind of, you know, go into a another quote tunnel. Quote tunnel. This is, I think, I don't know. I feel I should share this. <clears throat> Hafez says, "Stay close to anything that makes you glad you're alive." Hafez says, "I wish I could show you." The astonishing light of your own being. Similar to Attar, Hafez is another Sufi mystic poet. You know. Hafez says, I once asked the bird, how is it that you fly in this gravity of darkness? She responded, love lifts me. Hafez says, I have learned so much from God that I can no longer call myself a Christian, a Hindu, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Jew. The truth has shared so much of itself with me that I can no longer call myself a man, a woman, an angel, or even a pure soul. Love has befriended me so completely. It has turned to ash and freed me of every concept and image my mind has ever known. You know, just like how, you know, there's the pyramids of Egypt are a wonder of the world. This is a wonder. This quote was a wonder of a world in the, in the world of language. Hafez says, your heart and my heart are very, very old friends. <laughs> Hafez says, your love should never be offered to the mouth of a stranger, only to someone who has the valor and daring to cut pieces of their soul off with a knife then weave them into a blanket to protect you, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I see what he's saying here. I see, I see. <laughs> yeah, it's important to care for the moment.
Hafez says, it happens all the time in heaven. And someday it will bring, it will begin to happen again on earth. That men and women who are married Sorry guys, this is just uh, too long. I just noticed. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the next one. <laughs> Hafez says, <clears throat> Be kind to your sleeping heart. Take it out into the vast fields of light and let it breathe. Hafez says, I have a thousand brilliant lies for the question, how are you? I have a thousand brilliant lies for the question, what is God? If you think that the truth can be known from words, if you think that the sun and the ocean can pass through that tiny opening called the mouth, <laughs> oh, someone should start laughing. Someone should start wildly laughing now. Wow, wow. He's such a, he's such a nice poet that it makes you feel as if he's right here. What he means is that if you feel the vastness of this cosmos can be a subject, then people just laugh at you. <laughs> Hoffa says, what do sad people have in common? It seems they have all built a shrine to the past and often go there and do a strange wail and worship. What is the beginning of happiness? It is to stop being so religious like that. Hoffa says this place where you are right now, God circled on a map for you. Fear the cheapest room in the house. I would like to see you live in better conditions. Hoffa says, and when he says better conditions, he doesn't mean just physical conditions. Better, better uh, think of the mind as a view, so in a better view. Hafa says, I am in love with every church and mosque and temple and any kind of shrine because I know it is there that people say the different names of the one God. Hafa says, you yourself are your own obstacle. Rise above yourself. Hafa says, what happens when your soul begins to awaken, your eyes and your heart and the cells of your body to, to the great journey of love? Okay, let me read that again. He says, what happens when your soul begins to awaken your eyes and your heart and the cells of your body uh, to the great journey of love, when they awaken to the great journey of love? It's like he's answering it here. He says, first, there is, a one, there is wonderful laughter and probably precious tears and a hundred sweet promises and those heroic vows no one can ever keep. <laughs> but still God is delighted and amused. You once tried to be a saint. What happens when your soul begins to awake in this world? To our deep need to love and serve the friend? Oh, the beloved will send you one of his wonderful wild companions, like Hafez. This man is next level in his poetry. <laughs> Hafez says what we speak becomes the house we live in. Yeah, yeah, another version of it is the words you speak become the house you live in. That's very true, too, because your attention is left there. So get out of that room, you know. <laughs> Hoffa says, when all your desires are distilled, you will cast just two votes to love more and be happy. Hafa says, the heart is a thousand stringed instrument that, that can only be tuned with love. Hafa says, admit something. Everyone you see, you say to them, love me. <laughs> of course, you do not do this out loud. Otherwise, someone would, someone would call the cops. Still, though, think about this, this great pull in us to connect. Why not become the one who lives with a full moon in each eye? that is always saying, with that sweet moon language, what every other eye in this world is dying to hear. Yeah. 
I think what it means is that uh, the, the greatest effort of the states of mind of people must begin becoming externalized. We must reinvent the public stage uh, for a better world. Literally, the story of the world is better than the story we're telling ourselves now. Hoffa says there was a four-year-old child whose next-door neighbor was an el el elderly gentleman who had recently lost his wife. Upon seeing the man cry, the little boy went into the old gentleman's yard, climbed uh, onto his lap, and just sat there. When his mother asked what he had said to the neighbor, the little boy said, Nothing. I just helped him cry. Even after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, You owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights the whole sky. Just like how the nature of that child saw a human being in, in, a, in a sort of, let's say, low-frequency state, in a sort of uh, kind of hopeless state, the child went there to help the man cry. Look at the innocence of children. And Hafez kind of takes this metaphor in a much deeper level, and he says, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights the whole sky. Again, a, ge a genius architecture to language. You know, as if the sun's vastness doesn't, doesn't fight with the earth. And with that, the glow of the sun is received as the sky of what our earth holds. You know? Hafez says, run, my dear, from anything that may not strengthen your precious budding wings. Run like hell, my dear, from anything, from anyone like, likely to put a sharp knife into the sacred tender vision of your beautiful heart. Jesus Christ. Oh, it's, uh, that's like heart assassination, guys. It's messed up. <laughs> This, these, this guy's quotes are from 700 years ago, by the way. Hafez says, we are people who need to love because love is the soul's life. Love is simply creation's greatest joy. Very true. Hafez says, carry your heart through this world like a life-giving son. I think that's a good meditative kind of practice if someone wants to consider. Hafez says, the son will stand as your best man and whistle. And when you have found the courage to marry forgiveness, when you have found the courage to marry love, Fascinating. He says, we have come into this exquisite world to experience ever and ever more deeply our divine courage, freedom, and light. And then there's six more pages of this man's quotes, which I'm not going to get into right now. <laughs> but um, I think there's a, there's a value that the mystical mindset, at least at that time, in these two spheres of thought, into these two people, I could tell you, yes, the relationship with the moment can become omnipresent. And when it does, there will be a new hope found in collective survival. Right now, the way we're appearing as a humanity is appearing as a collective being, the science project after four billion years, is through a narrative. A story is the spirit of humanity. You know, they say in the spirit of honor, we rise, you know. The thing is, the mind is advanced. The issue is we can never update and upgrade ourselves if we don't acknowledge it. People learn too soon a lot of data about the external realm without wondering truly about how their nature is present. I found it fascinating in Japan for five years. The kid isn't taught anything. They just help the kid just uh, cultivate behavior and discipline and character, you know. And so I found, wow, fascinating, as if we, we cultivate the emotional uh, sensitivity and awareness. You know, some people have emotional discipline. For example, think of all those soldiers in the battlefield. They had emotional discipline. Their emotion was put into another room, and the condition of the moment at hand was responded to. George Patton he was a military man. He had this quote where he said, if everybody's thinking the same, nobody's thinking. And what that means is the system of the educational system should become multidimensional. There's like, rather than 8 billion unique eyes uh, adjusting to one educational system, one type of system, uh, it should be the system should find ways of adjusting to 8 billion eyes. But I don't know how, like, I don't know in how long the educational system will shape, shape like this. I find the easiest way all these politicians are trying to get the uh, kids uh, wasting their time in the streets is like, it's like, imagine if education 
we had this kind of relationship where um, before university, the child's educational system would pay the child for their work. Imagine a child who can earn from education. Like, it's fascinating. Imagine how many people who can use their mind to be violent can also use that same intensity for a, an expressive, subjective kind of exploration of what, where knowledge should, how knowledge should walk next. So I find that... Um, there's something there that it's like any amount of energy used in any moment, that energy could have totally been used in another way, you know. <laughs> so that means freedom of choice, of expression, yet with the content of the mind and what the person receives, it's like you pick up what you pick up. It's kind of like a radar, Do you know what I mean? <clears throat> so anyways, guys, um, I hope this talk was helpful. Um... If anybody has a comment or something to share, now's the best time. And I was thinking of kind of like starting a, probably like some sort of Facebook group for this channel. You know, I, I kind of explaining more this idea of School of Athens, you know. School of Athens 2.0. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Much blessings and namaste. And one last thing I should say is beyond the language threshold, new, new horizons and technology is a way to be accessed. Design has roots in, in the unknown. That's why the mind is a very precious opportunity to observe what really is, is being the moment. Anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. Much blessings and awesome.